When you look at this tree, you may think it is growing independently. However, the reality is that no living organism, including this tree, can grow in isolation. Every organism is surrounded by a host of abiotic and biotic components of the environment with which it continuously interacts. For example, this tree is influenced by a number of abiotic components such as temperature, water, light, soil and wind to name only a few. On the other hand, different biotic components such as pathogens, parasites, predators and competitors of this tree also play an important role in its survival. Just like this tree, we too are constantly interacting with our environment. Did you know that the study of an organism and its environment is the traditional definition of ecology? Although various ecologists define it differently, ecology invariably studies the interactions among organisms and between the organism and its abiotic environment. It is studied at four levels of biological organization. Interestingly, the abiotic environment never remains constant all year round. All places on Earth experience different seasons due to the tilt in the Earth's axis and its revolution around the Sun. Owing to the varying intensity and duration of solar heat, you find variations in temperature and precipitation at different places on the earth. Annual variations in temperature and precipitation are responsible for the formation of major biomes such as deserts, rainforests and the tundra. If you carefully study biome distribution, you will notice that the mean annual temperature and precipitation is less in the tundra region. Compared to deserts, precipitation is better in grasslands, although temperatures may sometimes be a little higher. The rainforests experience good rainfall throughout the year, though temperatures in the tropical rainforests are relatively higher than those in coniferous and temperate forests due to their proximity to the equator. The climate in the rainforests is so amicable that they are inhabited by nearly 40 to 75 percent of the world's species. It is believed that many new species of flora and fauna are yet to be explored in these rainforests. In India too, we find major biomes such as deserts, tropical rainforests, deciduous forests and coasts. Apart from climatic changes, each biome is also affected by local and regional variations which have resulted in the formation of a wide range of habitats. Some of these habitats are favorable, while others are harsh. The valley of flowers in Uttaranchal and the hilly regions of north, northeast and south India are some favorable habitats found in India, while some harsh habitats include the scorching Rajasthan desert, perpetually rain-soaked Meghalayan forests, permafrost regions in the Himalayas, mountain tops, boiling thermal springs in Uttaranchal and Sikkim, and 
deep ocean trenches in the Indian Ocean. Life exists in all these habitats regardless of whether they are favorable or harsh. The difference in chemical and physical conditions of these habitats is due to the variation in abiotic factors such as temperature, water, light and soil. Apart from interacting with abiotic factors, the organisms also interact with the other living organisms in their habitats such as pathogens, competitors, parasites and predators. This is the reason why organisms differ from habitat to habitat. For example, the plants and animals in the Rajasthan desert are different from those in the Meghalayan rainforest. It is assumed that organisms have evolved or modified themselves over time through natural selection to survive and reproduce in their respective habitats. For instance, desert plants have developed special mechanisms such as spongy stems which aid in storing water. The leaves too are reduced to tiny pointed spines which decrease the loss of water due to transpiration. Likewise, the camel has adapted itself to survive without water for up to 10 days at a stretch. On the other hand, plants growing in rainforests have developed special mechanisms such as leaves with drip tips and thick waxy surfaces which allow water to run off. Moreover, some climbers grow on tall plants to receive sunlight. In this way, every organism slowly adapts to the physico-chemical conditions of its habitat as well as its biotic components to survive and reproduce. If you observe your environment, you will notice several physical or abiotic factors such as temperature, water, light and soil. These abiotic factors have a strong bearing on the life and existence of plant and animal species in different regions of the planet. Moreover, every organism adapts itself in various ways to these factors. Temperature is one of the most important abiotic factors that influence the life of organisms. On Earth, the average temperature on land varies seasonally. Moreover, as you move away from the equator towards the poles, you will notice a progressive decrease in temperature. Similarly, as you climb mountains, temperature decreases with an increase in altitude. On our planet, temperature ranges from sub-zero levels in the polar areas and high altitudes to more than 50 degrees centigrade in tropical deserts in summer. Interestingly, there are some unique habitats such as thermal springs and deep-sea hydrothermal vents where the average temperature exceeds 100 degrees centigrade. Did you know that temperature influences the kinetics of enzymes and through it, basal metabolism and other physiological functions and activities performed by an organism? A few organisms can tolerate and live in a wide range of temperatures, while a majority of them are restricted to a narrow range of temperatures. Organisms that can tolerate a wide range of temperatures are called eurothermal, while organisms that can tolerate a narrow range of temperatures are called stenothermal. In fact, the levels of thermal tolerance of different species greatly influence their geographical distribution. 
For example, tropical plants such as banana and coconut cannot grow in temperate regions of the world. Similarly, pine and conifers, which are adapted to temperate regions, cannot grow in tropical regions or deserts. Likewise, in the animal kingdom, it is difficult for furry polar bears living in the polar ice caps to survive in warmer regions of the world. Similarly, camels are found only in arid regions of the world. Like temperature, water is another important abiotic factor that influences the life of organisms. In fact, life on Earth originated in water and is unable to sustain without it. However, water is not uniformly distributed across the planet. Dry places, such as deserts, have very little water reserves. Naturally, plants and animals have adapted themselves to optimally utilize water. By and large, water greatly influences the distribution of plants and their productivity on our planet. Apart from the availability of water, the quality of water is also important for organisms, particularly those living in aquatic habitats. Quality of water means the chemical composition, pH, as well as the salt concentration of water. The concentration of salt is measured as salinity in parts per thousand, or PPT, which has a significant influence on the life of aquatic organisms. Did you know that the concentration of salt in inland water is less than 5 PPT? In seawater, it is 30 to 35 ppt, while in hypersaline lagoons, it is more than 100 ppt. Some organisms tolerate a wide range of salinities, while others are restricted to a narrow range of salinities. Organisms that can tolerate a wide range of salinities are known as urihaline while organisms that can tolerate a narrow range of salinities are known as stenohaline. This also explains why many freshwater organisms cannot live in seawater for long and vice versa, as they would face osmotic problems. Apart from temperature and water, light is another abiotic component of the environment that affects living organisms. Plants, for instance, require light for photosynthesis and growth. In forests, many small shrubs and herbs are overshadowed by tall canopy trees and therefore receive very little sunlight. Such plants are still able to survive as they are adapted to synthesize their food in low sunlight conditions. In fact, many plants depend on sunlight to meet their photoperiodic requirements for flowering. For instance, flowers of Portulaca bloom after sunrise and close after sunset. Similarly, for many animals, sunlight is important for their existence. The diurnal and seasonal variations in light intensity and photoperiod signal them that it is time for their foraging, reproductive and migratory activities. Have you wondered how organisms survive in the deep sea? Organisms that live in deep waters make use of a different spectrum of light. When sunlight falls on the surface of water, a small percent is reflected back into the atmosphere, while the remaining filters downward. Did you know that the longer light rays of the light entering the sea are absorbed near the surface of the water, while the shortest light rays penetrate deep down? Thus, 
Photosynthesis in deeper waters occurs with blue and green rays, which are absorbed by the brown and red algae on the seabed. Interestingly, as the sun is the source of both light and temperature, the availability of light on land is closely linked with the temperature at any given place. Just as plants require light and water for their survival, they also require soil, another important abiotic component. On Earth, the nature and properties of soil varies in different places. The type of soil depends on the parent rock, climate, weathering process, how the soil is formed, and whether the soil is transported or sedimentary. Apart from these factors, various soil characteristics such as its composition, grain size, and soil aggregation determine its percolation and capacity to hold water. Characteristics such as pH and mineral composition of the soil and topography of the place greatly influence vegetation, which in turn determines the animals that can survive in that place. Similarly, in aquatic habitats, the sediments characteristics determine the type of benthic animals that can survive there. Organisms living in this zone are called benthos, which include chitons, oysters, mussels, sponges, corals, and crabs. In this way, various organisms adapt themselves to different abiotic factors of the environment, which include temperature, water, light, and soil. Did you know that sweating in summer, shivering in winter, and seeing frogs in the rain and not in summer or winter are all responses to changing abiotic factors? Ever since organisms have come into existence on our planet, they have been evolving to survive better and reproduce in their habitats. However, the abiotic conditions of many habitats are never constant and keep changing significantly with time. These changes in abiotic conditions also affect the organisms living in that particular habitat. To sustain life, many species, through a process called homeostasis, try to maintain the constancy of their internal environment. Homeostasis is defined as a physiological process by which an organism regulates its internal environment in response to the fluctuating external environment. Although organisms achieve homeostasis through physiological means, it can also be achieved through artificial means, which is best seen in human beings. Consider that you can study well when the temperature is around 25 degrees Celsius. But in summer, the heat makes you lethargic and hence you are unable to concentrate. By simply using an air conditioner or a cooler, you can make your external environment pleasant so that you can perform better. Such artificial means do not exist for animals and plants in nature. So how do they cope with such adverse situations? There are various ways by which organisms can respond to adverse external environments. They can regulate conform, migrate, hibernate, estivate, or suspend themselves under such circumstances. Let's take a look at each situation. Organisms that are capable of maintaining homeostasis by physiological or behavioral means are called regulators. 
the mechanism by which organisms regulate their constant body temperature, irrespective of the external temperature, is called thermoregulation. Similarly, the mechanism by which organisms regulate a constant osmotic concentration, irrespective of the external osmotic concentration, is called osmoregulation. A few lower invertebrates and vertebrate species, along with birds and mammals, are capable of regulation. For instance, human beings are capable of regulating their body temperature and maintaining it at 37 degrees Celsius. For example, in summer, when the external temperature is more than our body temperature, we perspire a lot. This results in evaporative cooling, which lowers our body temperature. Likewise, in winter, when the external temperature is much lower than our body temperature, we shiver. Shivering generates heat and raises our body temperature. Such a mechanism is seen in mammals, but is absent in plants. Evolutionary biologists believe that the success of mammals is greatly due to their ability to maintain a constant body temperature, which enables them to survive in extreme climates. Some organisms that are unable to regulate their internal environment may partially regulate their internal environment or conform to external conditions. These organisms are known as conformers. Studies show that almost 99% of animals and nearly all plants belong to this category. The body temperature of such organisms changes according to the ambient temperature. Similarly, in the case of aquatic organisms, their osmotic concentration changes according to the ambient water osmotic concentration. Although maintaining a constant internal environment has advantages, conformers did not evolve into regulators. The reason is that processes like thermoregulation and osmoregulation consume a lot of energy, particularly in small animals, where heat loss or heat gain is a function of the surface area. Such animals have a larger surface area compared to their volume, and so they tend to lose their body heat very quickly when the outside temperature is low. Moreover, they consume a lot of energy to generate body heat, and this is why you rarely find small animals in the polar regions. Interestingly, during the course of evolution, the costs and benefits of maintaining a constant internal environment were taken into consideration, and thus some organisms have evolved to become regulators, while others have remained conformers. Sometimes, stressful external conditions may be localized or have a short duration. In such situations, Organisms may migrate, hibernate, estivate, or suspend to survive. Particularly during winter, you may have read about or witnessed the arrival of migratory birds such as the greater flamingo, Siberian cranes, and northern shoveler from Siberia and other cold northern regions to the famous Kyoladio National Park in Bharatpur in Rajasthan. Similarly, in Europe too, people staying high up in the Alps come down to the valleys during winter. 
Migration is seen in animals that are capable of moving from stressful environmental conditions to a place that offers a favorable climate. But what about animals that are unable to migrate? Such animals are likely to cope with the unfavorable conditions by undergoing hibernation during winter to preserve energy and estivation in summer to avoid heat-related problems and desiccation. Interestingly, many zooplanktons in lakes and ponds are known to enter diapause, a state of suspended development during unfavorable conditions. Although these mechanisms are seen in animals, plants too show various responses to stressful external conditions. They usually suspend themselves in unfavorable conditions. In the case of bacteria, fungi, and lower plants, thick-walled spores are produced, which help them survive in unfavorable conditions and germinate in favorable conditions. Similarly, in higher plants, Seeds and other vegetative reproductive structures are produced which help overcome stressful periods besides helping in dispersal. This is done by reducing their metabolic activity and undergoing a dormancy period. In favorable conditions, these seeds and vegetative reproductive structures germinate to form new plants. In this way, we see that to respond to stressful abiotic conditions, various organisms regulate, conform, migrate, hibernate, estivate, or suspend themselves. Some animals live in arid regions, while some animals thrive in polar regions. Plants in the tropical rainforests have drip tips and thick waxy surfaces that allow water to run off, while desert plants have spongy stems which store water and leaves reduced to tiny pointed spines. On our planet, every organism adapts to stressful environmental conditions through morphological, physiological and behavioral means. In fact, the responses of these organisms are their adaptations to cope in unfavorable or stressful conditions. In other words, adaptation is any attribute of the organism that enables it to survive and reproduce in its habitat. Let's look at some of the morphological adaptations exhibited by organisms. Over the course of evolution, many adaptations have evolved and have been genetically fixed. Although life originated in water and is unable to sustain without it, some organisms can survive without water for days. In the case of the kangaroo rat in the North American deserts, the animal meets its water requirements by metabolic water. Metabolic water is released as a byproduct during oxidation of fat in its body. The body of this rodent is also capable of concentrating its urine so that very little water is used to remove waste products. Likewise, the camel can also survive without water for 10 days at a stretch and is capable of raising its body temperature to nearly 42 degrees Celsius to prevent the loss of water. Similarly, many desert plants have a thick layer of cuticle 
on their leaves with their stomata embedded in deep pits to reduce the loss of water through transpiration. These plants have also adopted a special photosynthetic pathway called CAM or Crassulacean Acid Metabolism which enables their stomata to remain closed during the day. Some desert plants like the Opuntia have leaves that are reduced to spines and its flattened spongy stems perform photosynthesis. While some plants and animals have adapted to prevent the loss of water, some animals, particularly those found in colder regions, have adapted themselves to prevent the loss of heat. For instance, mammals from colder climates generally have shorter tails, limbs and ears, which help reduce loss of heat. This adaptation is called Allen's Rule. Moreover, in the polar seas, Aquatic mammals such as seals, whales and dolphins have a thick layer of fat known as blubber below their skin which acts as an insulator and minimizes the loss of body heat. Apart from morphological adaptations, some organisms physiologically adapt themselves to respond to stressful situations. For example, as you ascend a mountain, Atmospheric pressure and oxygen decrease and you begin to experience altitude sickness. Its symptoms are fatigue, nausea and palpitations. But in two to three days, your body gets acclimatized to such stressful conditions. After which, you don't experience altitude sickness. This is because your body has increased the production of red blood cells, decreased the binding capacity of hemoglobin, and increased your rate of breathing to compensate for low levels of atmospheric oxygen. This also explains why tribes living in high altitudes have higher hemoglobin than those dwelling in the plains. While some organisms adapt themselves to live in high altitudes, a variety of marine invertebrates such as jellyfish, octopus, starfish and fish such as the anglerfish and lanternfish thrive in deep ocean waters where the pressure could be hundred times more than the normal atmospheric pressure. Such organisms show a fascinating array of biochemical adaptations to survive in such extreme conditions. Another interesting adaptation is by organisms found in harsh habitats such as deep sea hydrothermal vents and hot springs where temperatures exceed 100 degrees Celsius. Here, microbes belonging to the Archaebacteria form flourish. While some organisms thrive in temperatures above 100 degrees Celsius, other organisms flourish in the Arctic and Antarctic waters where temperatures are always below zero. Apart from physiological and morphological adaptations, some organisms also show behavioral adaptations to cope with their changing environment. For example, the desert lizard manages to keep its body temperature fairly constant by absorbing heat while lying in the sun when its body temperature is below normal. But when the ambient temperature is high, it moves into the shade. Likewise, some organisms such as earthworms, frogs, moles and snakes burrow into the soil to escape the above ground heat. Therefore, these animals are rarely seen on the ground in scorching summers. In this way, 
to adapt to unfavorable conditions, organisms have undergone morphological, physiological and behavioral changes. An individual never lives in isolation. It prefers to stay in association with other species or individuals of its own kind. Such a group of individuals belonging to the same species living in a given geographical area that share or compete for similar resources and interbreed only among themselves is known as population. For instance, in this forest, apart from this tribe, you will find an elephant, deer and tiger population. Although such populations interbreed or sexually reproduce, some groups of individuals that asexually reproduce, such as bacteria and fungi, also constitute a population. Populations of various organisms tend to cope with the changing environment for their survival. Evolutionary changes through natural selection take place at the population level and so population ecology is an important field of ecology. Interestingly, a population has certain characteristics or attributes such as birth and death rates, sex ratio, age distribution and population density which are statistically measured. However, these attributes cannot be calculated for individual organisms. Birth and death rates are expressed in terms of per capita. That is, by dividing the total number of births or deaths by the total population that exists in a given time period. For example, in a wetland, there were 100 typha plants last year and 60 new plants are added, taking the current population to 160. The birth rate is measured by dividing the total number of births by the total population, which is 60 divided by 100 or 0.6 offspring per typha per year. To understand death rate, consider a lake with a population of 25 fish, where 5 fish die a week. The death rate is calculated by dividing the total number of deaths by the total population in the fish population in a week, which is 5 divided by 25 or 0.5 fish per week. Apart from birth and death rates, another important attribute of a population is sex ratio. For example, in this tribe, 40% of the population are females and 60% are males. Moreover, at any point in time, this population consists of individuals who may belong to pre-reproductive reproductive and post-reproductive age groups. A graphical representation of the various age groups is known as the age pyramid. In the human population, the age pyramid shows the age distribution of males and females in the same diagram. In fact, the shape of the age pyramid reflects the growth status of the population and indicates whether the population is growing, stable or declining. Another important population attribute is the size of the population or the population density denoted by the letter N, which provides details of its status in its habitat. The size of the population is usually taken into consideration for studies on ecological processes in the population, such as the effect of pesticides or pollution, impact of predators, 
or competitors with other species. Moreover, a habitat may consist of several populations of different sizes. In this wetland, for instance, there are only 10 kingfisher birds, hundreds of cutla fish, thousands of typha plants, and millions of Clemidomonas. Although the total number of individuals of a species provides the most appropriate measure of its population density, in some cases, measuring population density in terms of numbers is either meaningless or difficult to determine. For instance, if there are 200 Parthenium plants growing under a single huge banyan tree, it would be incorrect to say that the population density of banyan tree is very low compared to the Parthenium plants. In such a case, the biomass density or the biomass per unit area or volume of the banyan tree provides a meaningful measure of the population size. Thus, Population density can be a biomass density or a numerical density. Sometimes, estimating the total number of individuals in the population may not be possible as the size may be huge or counting may take a lot of time. Think of the effort and number of hours you would require to count the number of fish in a lake. Under such circumstances, measuring relative density will serve its purpose. That is, the number of fish caught per trap provides a good measure of its total population density in the lake. In some cases, the population size of certain individuals is assessed without seeing or counting them. For example, the tiger census in our national parks and tiger reserves is often done based on bug marks and fecal pellets. Thus, population attributes provide important information about the organisms in a particular habitat and they provide the basis for further ecological studies and research. Populations of all organisms on planet Earth are dynamic as they are constantly changing due to their interactions with various biotic and abiotic factors. At any point in time, in a population, some organisms are born, some die, some immigrate while some emigrate. These four processes are known as natality, mortality, immigration and emigration respectively. Natality is the number of births in the population that are added to the initial density during a given period. While mortality is the number of deaths in the population during a given period. Immigration is the number of individuals of the same species that come into a particular habitat from elsewhere during a given period. While emigration is the number of individuals of a population who leave a particular habitat and go elsewhere during a given period. In a population, natality and immigration result in an increase in population density while mortality and emigration result in a decrease in population density. Now, let's consider this flow diagram where N is the population density at time T. Now, the density at time T plus 1 can be calculated as shown. Although the number of births and deaths greatly influence population density, in some cases, immigration and emigration assume importance.
For instance, if a newly formed habitat is colonized by great egret birds, the immigration of the egrets has a greater significance in determining the population density rather than the natality in this population. Likewise, if most of these birds fly to another wetland, then the emigration of these birds has a significant contribution to determining population density rather than deaths in this population. Thus, populations grow through births and immigration and decline through deaths and emigration. Growth is the most fundamental dynamic feature exhibited by populations. Interestingly, population growth exhibits two patterns, exponential growth and logistic growth. Let's understand these patterns in detail. When resources available to the individuals in a population are unlimited, there is a tendency of the individuals to grow exponentially or in a geometric manner. This behavior was observed by Charles Darwin while he was developing his theory of natural selection. He also showed that a slow growing animal such as the elephant could also reach enormous numbers if resources such as food and space were inexhaustible. Let's take the example of the pistia plant. When it is introduced in a water body, due to unlimited food and space, these plants grow exponentially and cover the entire water body in a matter of a few days. Considering the population size as N, birth rates as B, and death rates as D, the increase or decrease in population size during a unit time period T is as shown. The difference between the birth and death rates provides the value of R or the intrinsic rate of natural increase. This is a very important parameter for measuring the impact of biotic or abiotic factors on population growth. The intrinsic rate of natural increase is a measure of the inherent potential of a population to grow. Did you know that the value of R for the Norway rat is 0 0.015 and for the flower beetle is 0 0.12? These numbers indicate that the rate at which the population size of the flower beetle increases is greater compared to the Norway rat. Now, to determine the population growth pattern of the Pistia plant, we plot various readings of population density against time. On plotting the readings, you will notice a J-shaped curve which shows two phases, a lag phase followed by an acceleration phase. Moreover, with the basic knowledge of calculus, you can derive the integral form of the exponential growth using the equation as shown. Thus, an exponential growth pattern is seen when resources are unlimited. However, when resources are limited, the population growth pattern is logistic. There is always competition between individuals for limited resources and finally, the fittest individuals survive and reproduce. Keeping this fact in mind, the governments of many countries have introduced various restraints to limit human population growth.
in fact in nature a given habitat has sufficient resources to support a maximum number of individuals beyond which no further growth is possible this maximum capacity or limit is called the carrying capacity of the species in that habitat which is denoted by the letter K let us consider the population growth pattern of the mandarin duck in this wetland for this we plot various readings of population density against time on plotting the readings you will notice an S-shaped curve or a sigmoid curve. From the graph, you can see that for a population growing in a habitat with limited resources, there are three phases. Initially, a lag phase, followed by phases of acceleration and deceleration, and finally, an asymptote when the population density reaches the carrying capacity. The logistic growth is also known as Verhulst Pearl Logistic Growth after the scientists Pierre-Francois Verhulst and Raymond Pearl and is described by the equation as shown. In nature, as the resources available for growth are limited, the logistic growth model is considered a more realistic one. Thus, we can say that population density is dynamic and the growth of the population is dependent on the resources available. In every habitat, microbes, plants, and animals interact in various ways to form a community. When populations of two different species interact, it leads to interspecific interactions. Such interactions may benefit, harm, or have a neutral effect on one or both species. In mutualism, both species benefit from interaction, while in commensalism, the interspecific interaction is beneficial to one species and neutral to the other. In the case of amensalism, one species is harmed and the other remains unaffected. Let's begin with mutualism. Plants and animals show diverse and fascinating examples of mutualism. Did you know that lichens also exhibit mutualism type interaction? In lichens, algal and fungal partners live together by mutually benefiting each other. The algal partner provides food to the fungal partner and in return, the fungal partner provides shelter to the algal partner. Likewise, some higher plants also show mycorrhizal association in which fungi are connected to the roots of the plant. The fungi help the plant absorb nutrients from the soil while the plant provides food in the form of carbohydrates to the fungi. Mutual relationships are also seen between plants and animals. For example, plants take the help of insects, birds and animals for pollination as well as dispersal of seeds. In return, plants provide these pollinators with juicy nectar and seed dispersers 
with nutritious fruits. In fact, a given fig species is pollinated only by its partner wasp species and no other species. The wasp serves as a pollinator while the fruit serves as an overposition or egg laying site. In addition, the developing seeds inside the fruit provide nutrition to the growing larvae. Mutualism is also seen in many orchids that have evolved to attract the right pollinator insect and ensure that pollination takes place. A fascinating example is the case of a Mediterranean orchid called Ophrys, which uses sexual deceit to get pollinated by a bee species. One of the petals of this orchid resembles a female bee in size, color and markings. A male bee gets attracted to this petal, which he perceives as a female and pseudo-copulates with the flower. During this process, the pollen of this flower gets dusted on the bee. Now, when this bee pseudo-copulates with another flower, it transfers the pollen to this flower, thereby pollinating it. However, during evolution, if the female bee's color patterns change, then the success of pollination will decrease unless the orchid flower co-evolves such that its petals continue to resemble the female bee. This is how co-evolution operates in nature. Apart from mutualism, another interspecific interaction is commensalism seen in plants, animals and the aquatic world. A common example of commensalism in plants is seen between an orchid growing on the branch of a mango tree. Although this epiphyte benefits from the interaction, the mango tree is neither harmed nor benefited. Another example of commensalism is seen in leguminous plants such as pea, beans and lentils, which are associated with the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, rhizobium. The bacteria in the root nodules live symbiotically with the host plant. They obtain nutrition from the host plant and in return fix atmospheric free nitrogen as nitrites and nitrates. Among animals, commensalism can be seen between cattle egrets and cattle. Have you ever wondered why these two organisms are found in close association in fields? This is because while grazing, the cow stirs up insects hidden in the vegetation, which are otherwise difficult for the egrets to locate. Another fascinating example of commensalism is seen between sea anemone and clownfish. Although the sea anemone has stinging tentacles, the clownfish finds it a comfortable place to live as it receives protection from predators. However, in this interaction, the sea anemone is neither benefited nor harmed. Apart from commensalism and mutualism, amensalism is another interspecific interaction seen in nature. In this interaction, one species is harmed and the other remains unaffected. Usually in this type of interaction, an organism oozes a chemical compound which is detrimental to another organism. For example, the black walnut tree 
exudes a substance called jaglon into the soil which damages the roots of neighboring plants thereby preventing other plants from growing nearby. Another common example of amensalism is shown by penicillium, a bread mold which secretes penicillin, a chemical that kills or stops the growth of bacteria. In this manner, various species exhibit interspecific interactions like amensalism, commensalism, and mutualism that aid in their overall survival and reproduction. In any habitat, plants, animals, and microbes interact in various ways to form a community. When populations of two different species interact, it leads to interspecific interactions. Such interactions may benefit, harm, or have a neutral effect on one or both species. Using a plus sign for beneficial interaction, minus sign for detrimental or harmful interaction, and zero for neutral interaction, the possible outcomes of the interspecific interactions are shown in the table. During competition, both species lose out during the interaction, while in parasitism, the interspecific interaction benefits one species and harms the other. During the stages of evolution, several species may have competed with each other for survival. Darwin had therefore mentioned that competition was a powerful force in the organic evolution as species struggled for survival. Competition may occur between closely related species, for instance, sheep and goat grazing the same meadows in the Himalayas, as well as unrelated species for the same limiting resources. For example, the visiting flamingos and the resident fish in the shallow lakes of South America compete for zooplankton, their common food. In some cases, limiting resources may not lead to competition. This is because the feeding efficiency of one species is reduced in the presence of another species, even if resources are abundant. Such a competition is known as interference competition. Therefore, competition is best defined as a process in which the fitness of one species measured in terms of its intrinsic rate of natural increase, or R, is significantly lowered in the presence of another species. To explain competitive release, Connell conducted field experiments on the rocky sea coasts of Scotland using Balanus and Cathamalus. The experiment showed that the larger and competitively superior barnacle Balanus dominated the intertidal area and excluded the smaller barnacle Cathamalus from that zone. However, some recent studies do not support such generalizations about competition. Although they do not reject the occurrence of interspecific competition, they propound that species facing competition might evolve mechanisms to promote coexistence rather than exclusion. One such mechanism is resource partitioning. That is, if two species compete for the same resource, they could avoid competition by choosing different developing or foraging patterns. For example, 
two competing species of monkey that consume the fruit of the same species of tree will avoid competition by choosing different trees growing in the same forest. An experiment conducted by MacArthur showed that five closely related species of warblers living on the same tree were able to avoid competition and coexist due to behavioral differences in their foraging activities. Apart from competition, parasitism is another interspecific interaction observed in nature. In a parasitic mode of life, the parasite gets food from the host. Thus, parasitism is advantageous and has developed in many taxonomic groups from plants to higher vertebrates. In fact, many parasites have evolved to be host-specific. In such cases, both the host and the parasite tend to co-evolve. That is, if the host develops special mechanisms for resisting its parasite, the parasite too evolves mechanisms to counteract them to continue its association with the same host species. For instance, secretions from the human digestive system help to kill parasites that enter it, while the parasites adapt themselves to resist their host. Besides, many parasites have a complex life cycle as they depend on one or two intermediate hosts or vectors. Did you know that the female mosquito is not a parasite but is a vector as it carries the malarial parasite plasmodium? Depending on where parasites live, they are classified as ectoparasites or endoparasites. Parasites that feed on the surface of a host are called ectoparasites, while those that live inside a host are called endoparasites. Some common examples of ectoparasites are ticks, lice, and cuscuta. On the other hand, tapeworms and hookworms are examples of endoparasites. Although the life cycles of these parasites have become complex, their morphological and anatomical features have simplified. Since parasites are partially or totally dependent on a host, they have developed special adaptations such as the loss of a digestive system and other unnecessary sense organs such as eyes, a high reproductive capacity and the presence of adhesive organs or suckers to hold on to the host. Studies show that a large number of parasites are detrimental to their hosts as they make them more susceptible to predation by making them physically weak, reduce their growth, survival, reproduction, as well as reduce the size of their population. Interestingly, a few birds show brood parasitism in which the parasitic bird lays its eggs in a host's nest for incubation. Additionally, during the course of evolution, the eggs of such parasitic birds have grown to resemble the host's eggs with regard to size and color to minimize the chances of being detected by the host bird. Thus, Interspecific interactions such as parasitism and competition guarantee the survival and reproduction of species. On Earth, no single habitat exists with just one species. All species on this planet not only coexist but also depend on each other for their survival. Plants, for instance, need soil microbes to decompose organic matter into inorganic nutrients 
which are needed for their growth. Also, many plants depend on birds and insects for pollination. Just as plants depend on animals for their existence, animals too depend on plants directly or indirectly for their survival. As a result, in any habitat, plants, animals and microbes interact in various ways to form a community. When populations of two different species interact, it leads to interspecific interactions. Such interactions may benefit, harm or have a neutral effect on one or both species. Using a plus sign for beneficial interaction, a minus sign for detrimental or harmful interaction and a zero for neutral interaction, the possible outcomes of interspecific interactions is shown in the table. When both species benefit from the interaction, it results in mutualism. On the other hand, if both species lose out during the interaction, it results in competition. In both parasitism and predation, the interspecific interaction benefits one species while it harms the other species. However, when interspecific interaction is beneficial to one species and neutral to the other, the interaction is known as commensalism. On the other hand, if the interaction of one species is harmed and the other is unaffected, the interaction is known as amensalism. Interestingly, a common feature seen in predation, parasitism and commensalism is that the interacting species live close together. Let's look at predation in detail. When members of one species called the predator feeds on another species called the prey, the interaction is known as predation. For plants, herbivores are the predators, which in turn are predated by carnivores. In fact, predation helps in the transfer of energy from one trophic level to another. Apart from functioning as conduits for energy transfer, predators also help to keep prey populations under control. In some cases, the prey species grows so large that it may cause instability in the ecosystem. For example, due to the absence of natural predators in a specific geographical area, the introduction of an exotic species such as the water hyacinth causes it to grow and spread fast and wide. For example, the introduction of a prickly pear cactus into Australia in the early 1920s created havoc as this plant spread rapidly into millions of hectares of rangeland. The spread was brought under control only after the introduction of a moth, Cactoblastis cactorum a cactus feeding predator from South America. Such biological control methods are also used to control agricultural pests. Another function of predators is to help maintain species diversity, thereby minimizing the intensity of competition among competing prey species. For example, a starfish Disaster is an important predator in the rocky intertidal communities on the American Pacific coast. It feeds on a mussel, Mytilus, and is responsible for maintaining the species diversity in intertidal communities. In an experiment, 
all the starfish were removed from an enclosed area. This resulted in the rapid expansion of the mussel population and more than 10 invertebrate species became extinct within a year due to interspecific competition. The interaction between Pisaster and Mytilus thus helped maintain the species diversity in these communities. If a predator is highly efficient, it can overexploit its prey, thereby resulting in the extinction of its prey and eventually itself. However, such a situation rarely occurs in nature as predators are prudent. They do not kill too many prey and leave some for later. Several prey species too have evolved various defenses to lessen the impact of predation. Some species of insects and frogs use camouflage to protect themselves from predators. Moreover, some prey contain poisonous chemicals which keep predators away. For instance, the monarch butterfly contains a chemical that makes it highly distasteful to predator birds. Interestingly, the butterfly acquires this chemical in its caterpillar stage by feeding on a poisonous weed. These are some ways in which animals escape predation. But how do plants protect themselves from predation by herbivores? In fact, nearly 25% of insects are phytophagous which means they feed on plant sap and other plant parts. Therefore, plants have developed a variety of morphological and chemical defense mechanisms against herbivores. The presence of thorns and spines is the most common morphological means of defense in some plants like acacia and cactus. Also, a few plants like Calotropis and some fungi have chemical defense mechanisms which include the production of harmful and distasteful chemicals. These chemicals make the herbivore sick, inhibiting its digestion, impacting its reproduction and sometimes may even kill the predator. In fact, the Calotropis plant produces a highly poisonous cardiac glycoside, which is why animals don't consume this plant. Did you know that a wide variety of chemicals such as nicotine, caffeine, quinine and opium extracted for commercial purposes are actually produced by plants as defenses against grazers? Therefore, in nature, Species not only coexist, but also show various interspecific interactions, predation being the most common.